Welcome to another NCWA Virtual Shop Talk. I'm your host, Bill Pierce. This is Sunny Day Dulcimers Part 2. We're here again with club member John Ellis at his shop in Arlington, Washington. Last time, we talked about the dulcimer, wood selection, and wood bending techniques. Today, we'll talk more with John about how he builds his dulcimers. So, John, what about special jigs, especially for glue-up? Bill, I, I don't use any hardware, screws or nails or anything like that in any of my building. I try and keep with the traditional building methods that the old timers used back in the, back in the day. And um, it's just a personal thing to not have any extra hardware in my instruments. Um, I will qualify that by saying there are two screws in each tuning machine that holds the tuning machine into the peg head. There are also four little screws down here that I use for the uh, string pins, but they aren't holding the, the dulcimer together. I have dropped, at least on a couple of occasions, instruments being built from workbench height down to the floor and never lost a glue joint to speak of. Uh, biggest damage that's been done is just some dents in the wood. So, um, so I'm, I'm pretty proud of that fact. Um, jigs are not really too specialized for any of the glue up process. More, I would say, I use specially adapted aids. Um, one thing that you can buy at a luthier. A luthier, I haven't used that term yet. A luthier is a maker of stringed instruments. People ask me if I'm a luthier. I, I guess by that definition, I do make stringed instruments. I tell them, no, I'm not a luthier. I, I feel that that's a craft that is reserved for the upper echelon. I'm just a builder. But there are luthier supply houses all over the place that you can buy luthier tools. Um, they sell a very similar thing called a spool clamp to this. I got a piece of closet rod, six foot long, cut it into pieces, put a, a drilled hole, put some felt coverings in, and when I glue the top and the back on, or the soundboard and the back on, I glue around the edges, put one on, my spool clamp goes on here, and I usually put about 18 or 20 of them on all the way around, so there's one every couple inches, get a good solid even pressure on that to get that glue dried up nice. Um, so that's kind of a special thing. Part of the fun of learning the craft when I first started this was figuring out how to do some of this stuff instead of spending eight dollars a piece on these clamps from the luthier supply, build one for a dollar and a half. You know, it just part of the Scotch Irish in me, I guess. I like to save a dollar when I can. Um, another interesting thing is I, I very, very nicely brace the inside of my instrument to, to add more strength to it. I use what's called kerfing, which is basically um, it's almost dental molding if, if you're into molding work around fireplaces and doorways and things like that. It'd be similar to that, but this is just starts out as like a three-quarter by six-inch board that I take to the um, radial arm saw and just keep running curves across the board. Then I take it to the bandsaw and rip it lengthwise so I end up with these little boards like this. They're used to be bent around the curves, both inner and outer curves of the instrument like so. If you can imagine, with the side only being one eighth, inch, one eighth inch thick, that's not much glue surface for this top to glue to. So you glue this to the side, then you glue the top inside, I should say, inside the instrument is glued to the side like this, like this, like this. Then you've got now suddenly a half inch wide or more surface for glue surface to adhere to. Really adds to the strength of the uh, instrument. We want it to last a good long while for the people that are getting it. 
I also put a cross brace, sometimes two, depending on the shape of the instrument. Uh, crossways inside here starts out as a piece of mahogany. Uh, what's that? Three sixteenths, maybe by whatever size you want, depending on where you're going to put it. So if we were going to put it, say, here, and you have to be mindful of where your sound holes are going to be. You don't want it going across your sound holes. So maybe it would go here. Once I have my body glued up to the shape I want to keep it in, I then measure, cut these before I... First thing I do is, is um, take a Forstner bit, round out the ends of the cutout here, then take that to the next step with the uh, cutout of the hole inside. At that point then I glue onto the end of it little boards because this is end grain. All of us woodworkers know that end grain doesn't glue as well as, as the regular side and top grain of the wood. So by doing, putting this on here, I've got side grain as well as end grain to glue to. I then take those and mark them to the correct angle that they need to be to go where I want them to go here. Then I take them over to the chop saw cut them at those angles here, then they're going to glue up just about like that. On the peg head, another little trick I learned and could be applied to other woodworking projects probably as well. On the peg head itself, it starts out as a, depending again on the body shape, um, it may be wider than this. It may be probably no narrower than this. But depending on the angle I want to achieve here at this portion of the body, I have a whole drawer full of pre-cut angle blocks. Um, there's a, a 25 and a 25 right there. So I'm going to glue to that. I'm sorry to put this down like that. It's going to be a little harder to see, but basically I want to achieve this angle to match this part of the body. So it could be anywhere from a, a 22 degree angle up to a 30 to 35 degree angle even. Um, I found the best luck I have is I, I tried at first to just not have these lap joints cut out here and just put these against here, but they tended to slide a lot this way. So I, I leave the lap joint in there now. I take my other matching guys here. So now when I clamp them, I'm clamping against two parallel surfaces and they just tighten right in there very nicely. Um, that's about it really for special jigs or forms for glue up. Uh, otherwise pretty straightforward, just slap it on and let it dry. When you build your fingerboards, I would think the accuracy of the spacing of the frets must be pretty important to keep the tonal pitch in tune. How do you achieve this accuracy? And what margin of error is there, if any? Excellent question, and you are exactly right, Bill. That is very true. Um, musical instruments, one common thing they all have is some sort of a musical stringed instruments, I should say. They all have a fret or fingerboard, can be used interchangeably, those terms, and a nut, which is where the strings come over this end, and a bridge, which is down at this end. The distance from the nut to the bridge is what's known as the vibrating string length. And that's a critical measurement. Dulcimers usually are built, and instruments can be built any size the builder wants to build them. Um, most of my instruments, I use a 27 inch 
VSL or vibrating string length. Some people will order a little smaller. The difference in the string length, the VSL, basically the big difference it makes is not so much tone quality but spacing of the frets. So the longer your VSL is, here's a, a fretboard that would fit anywhere from a 29 to a 33 inch VSL. It would be on an instrument going out to here. Well, what that would do as that length increases, so does the distance between the frets increase. What that means is that a person with very large, beefy hands would maybe want a longer VSL so he can get his fingers to fit better. Perhaps a child or maybe a person with dainty little hands, a woman with small hands, couldn't reach all those frets the way the big beefy handed guy could. So she's going to want a shorter VSL so she can make the same chords up here with her fingers without having it reach too far. Um, if you think of a piano, piano keys are all a given same width. So the person has to adjust their hand. If they've got a big hand, they've got to squeeze together on the piano keys. This eliminates that squeezing together or reaching further out. Um, so once you know the VSL, the vibrating string length, all of these fret spacings are very simply, and not so simply perhaps, just a mathematical equation that has to do with octave distances and half distances and half of half and so forth. There are a whole bunch of different people that have done the math for us already. So you can go online, get a sheet that, that you can look up at a luthier supply house, for instance, and say, what are the measurements for my fret spacing on a 27-inch VSL? And they will give it right out there to you for however many frets you want. The problem I encountered when I started doing this was that those measurements they give you are in thousands of an inch. And I don't know about you guys and gals, but none of my rulers are marked in thousands of an inch. You know, my, my smallest measurement I can even come close to seeing on my ruler is a 64th of an inch. Big difference between a 64th and a thousandth. So I had to do some extrapolating of the numbers to figure out how I could get as accurate as possible without the fancy laser machines or however they do it at the big factories. So I, I got to thinking here and I found a fractional decimal chart. There's hundreds of these available anywhere you want to look for one that will give you your fractions and the decimal, decimal equivalent of those so for instance, on an instrument with a 27-inch vibrating string length, the call out for the number 10 fret is at 11.847 or 847 thousandths of an inch from the nut to the 10th fret. To get that number into something I could work with, I, I first find out where it will go on my decimal chart. This decimal chart has them marked out to 10 thousandths of an inch in spacing here. So I use that number to round off this number, get it down to a thousandth. So 8438 would round off to 844 thousandths. That number that the chart gave us 11.847 would land right about here. So it's between 27 30 seconds and 55 60 fourths. It's actually closer. It's three thousandths of an inch bigger than this, 12 thousandths of an inch smaller than this. So it's closest to this. So I would use 27 30 seconds for my measurement. That's a number I can work with on my ruler. And I have not had anyone complain that my accuracy is, is off. Um, I think I said down here, this could result in an error margin of three one thousandths of an inch. I don't think any human ear 
is going to be able to differentiate that unless, unless you were born with a tuning fork in your ear. So, um, so once I do that, I measure my distances. Also, always they recommend that you measure each fret, not from the previous fret, but from the nut. So you measure this one to here, and you measure this one to here rather than from here to here and here to here. It's just basically to prevent compounding error. If one is off, they all get off as you keep marching up the scale. But if you measure each one from here, they, they turn out pretty good. I've had no complaints on them, so I guess we're doing something right. John, you said you offer your customers a choice of sound holes when they design their instruments. Could you tell us a bit about what the options are and how you cut them? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, I should point out probably that from my research into the history of this instrument, this one here is probably one of the first designs made back in the day in Appalachia Valleys and mountaintops was uh, basically these were poor, poor people. They didn't have anything extra to waste on something like this. So they used what they had at hand. And often they would find or get, acquire somehow, cigar boxes, which in those days were made of wood. And they would put two or three cigar boxes together to create the body of the instrument. And they ended up then making a rectangular instrument like this. This is my, what I call my base instrument. When somebody wants a dulcimer, this is where we start. Then as they change some of the options, the price goes up from here. This starts at $220. If they want um, a different shape, there are various shapes. This is probably the most traditional one. It's called the hourglass. I mentioned that earlier. Next best known is the teardrop, which is shown here. And as you can see, different sound holes in each one. These are F holes. This one has hearts. Then this one has little rectangles to kind of match with the rectangular shape of the body. So one of the options that a customer has when creating a custom instrument for themselves are various sound hole options. And I have a little box with samples in it that they can pick from. So here would be the heart sample shape. Um, horse head, one girl wanted horse head of some type, hummingbird, lightning, all sorts of different ones that, that I have. That's not a bad catch for an old guy, right? Yeah. One Canadian customer wanted a maple leaf. So we have those. And I cut them now. I originally started doing them with a, just a, a scroll saw. And I just, it was very time consuming. And it just went against my goal of keeping the cost of the instrument down because I could get to this shape, build this soundboard, and then in cutting out the sound holes, one mistake, and I start over. Well, I couldn't pass that cost on to the customer. Every time I made a mistake, I didn't feel that was right. So I, I needed something that was a little more reliable that would turn out a good looking hole the same each time I did it. Because you do four of them on one instrument, you want them all to be the same. So I, I did some of my first profits that I garnered out of making these instruments went into buying a CNC machine, a computer number carving machine. And it, um, it's been a big help in keeping the price down and keeping the quality high. So that's how I cut them now. And, and I haven't had to redo but maybe one sound top when I didn't have the board secured quite properly on the machine. Um, some other options I can talk about while we're here too. Um, we talked about the different woods we could use in the different parts of the body. We talked about the peg heads being either a scroll shape or a guitar shape like this. I have about five different um, tuning machines that we can use. Nickel plated, a gold plated, 
either um, black knobs, white knobs, nickel plated knobs. So the person can pick out what, what tuners they want to use. Um, we have different colored um, dots, inlays, we can put in the fingerboard just to kind of add a nice little touch that way. This is um, abalone shell here. What about tools, John? There must be some specialized tools for making dulcimers, particularly putting the frets on the fretboard. There are, um, and you can get as fancy or as plain as you want based on your budget or your level of expertise demanded, things like that. But um, this is a new acquirement that I just got recently. Uh, it's called an Arbor Press. M most machinists would be familiar with this tool. It's used for pressing bearings into shafts and things like that. But um, I use it for installing the frets, as you mentioned. And I, I mentioned earlier the uh, spool clamps that I use. I made those for myself. You can buy these ready-made. Another tool I use that um, is called a fret rocker. This is used to determine if there's one fret higher than the others on your fretboard. So you find the length of the side that will span three frets adjacent to each other, like these three here, and then try and rock it using one of them as a fulcrum. If you don't get any rock, you know they're all the same height. For example, if you had one higher than the other, you would hear that little rock going on there. Then as the frets get closer together, you move to other sides of the tool to measure Again, three frets at a time, always determining whether the middle one is high or not. A scrap piece of aluminum down at the, at the steel yard was free in their dumpster. Um, I polished it up, ground the surfaces flat on my, on my sanding machine, saved me $15 from the Luthier Supply House. The Arbor Press that's used to press the frets into the slots on the fretboard I started out with just, again, a piece of scrap steel, ground smooth and flat and true on one side, welded it to a bolt, chucked it in my drill press, and used my drill press for a number of years till just recently when I got this. But uh, I think this is going to be a nice addition to my shop. Um, might be of some interest to see just how the frets are put in. I don't know that this would play to anyone using this technique on any other woodworking project or not, but uh, just for purpose of show and tell. Once the slots are cut in the fretboard here, the fret wire is basically seated just a little bit proud of the edge and then tapped into place with a little dead blow hammer here. Put under the arbor press and just seat it down into the wood like that and nipped off with the fret nippers here. Then you just got a little dress up here, work with file or sandpaper to smooth off these edges and your fret is set in there. The, the shape of the fret wire itself is such that it's T-shaped with a rounded edge that you push the strings against. The part that goes into the wood is, is it's 23 thousandths of an inch thick, and it has little tangs on there that are placed at angles all the way up and down. So when they go into the slot, it's like a fish hook. It grabs the wood and doesn't allow it to be pulled back out. Some people will actually put a drop of CA glue or super glue in the slot to hold it in there. I've not done that before, and I've not had any trouble with them coming out that I'm aware of, so I don't know how necessary that is. But um, 
that's about it for really uh, most of the other tools involved are just standard woodworking tools. Wow, time has flown by. We hope you've gathered some useful information. Thanks so much, John, for sharing your love of dulcimer building with us. Any closing remarks? Well, I just want to thank you, Bill, and the club with um, closing remarks that uh, I've enjoyed partaking of this little adventure with sharing that information because that's what I really love to do. Um, I, I have been in conversation with Greg and Jim and Bill that um, in the future we hope to get away from these COVID restrictions and be able to start meeting in person again and to start up classes again. And we've kind of toyed with the idea of I would be happy uh, to present a dulcimer building class. We've been thinking that maybe something along the line of three or four weekends, one day you know, each weekend, and um, actually have the participants end up with a finished dulcimer that, that they've built themselves. It's certainly just in the planning stages now. We don't know when that time will be, if it's going to be this summer or, or later than that. But uh, we are thinking about it, so we would like to invite you to likewise think about it. If you've got interest in making a dulcimer of your own, let one of us know, and uh, we'll see if we can put something together down the road a ways here. Thanks again for the opportunity to, to share this information, and good woodworking to you.